is not a journey. It's a series of kind of um, travel writing short stories, non-fiction. Uh, and I talked to nine people who represent nine different forms of Indian spirituality lived in, in modern India. Um, and I was very struck by how very regional so many forms of devotion are. Um, the bowels in Bengal. Every Bengali knows the Baal songs, knows the Baals, but go to Orissa and no one's ever heard of them. Uh, it, go to Rajasthan, everyone knows Papuji and the, uh, and the, the various epics that he represents, but uh, no one's ever heard of the Tam dancing from Kerala, which is on the cover. Um, and so I talked to a Tam dancer, a Jain nun, a Buddhist monk, uh, and each of them are extraordinary people in their own right, all anonymous figures, no one famous in the book, but... Um, all have extraordinary stories and uh, in, in one way um, or other represent a different facet of, of, of modern Indian spirituality. But the most, I mean, sometimes I would, these things were people I'd spent several months with, and the Baals, for example, I wandered around with for a very long time and then went on tour with, with when the book came out. Um, but the most moving meeting for me was the woman I probably knew for the shortest period of time in the research period, for 48 hours. Uh, I bumped into an extraordinary Jain nun um, who was, had just was in the process of trying to come to terms with a great loss. She had spent her entire professional life as a nun since she left her family and went off on the road walking with another nun. And there'd obviously been a, a, an incredibly close relationship um, that you could probably call love between them. They'd been entirely dependent on each other's company. They'd walked from one end of India to another. Uh, and this woman had then got very ill. And uh, this is a passage where she describes her friend's illness. <coughs> Everyone had warned us about the difficulty of this life, said Prasanna Matamataji. But in reality, we'd left everything willingly. So we did not miss the world we had left behind. Not at all. It is the same as when a girl gets married and has to give up her childhood and her ch parents' home. If she does it in exchange for something she really wants, it is not a sad time, but instead a very joyful one. Certainly for Priyagamati and me, it was the happiest period of our lives. Every day we would walk and discover somewhere new. Walking is very important to us Jains. The Buddha was enlightened while sitting under a tree, but our great Tirthankara Mahavira was enlightened while walking. We believe that walking is an important part of our tapasya. We don't choose cars or vehicles because travelling so fast can kill many living creatures, and perhaps also because we have two legs and travelling on foot is the right speed for human beings. Walking sorts out your problems and anxieties and calms your worries. Living from day to day from inspiration to inspiration. Much of what I have learnt as a Jain comes from wandering. Sometimes even my dreams are of walking. It was while walking that Prayogamati began to realise that her health was fading. Because she had difficulty in keeping up with me, we noticed there was something wrong with her joints. She began to have real difficulty in walking, or even more in sitting or squatting. For ten years, her condition got worse. By the end, it pained her to move at all, and she had difficulty moving or sitting. Then one afternoon, when she was studying the scriptures in a monastery in southern Karnataka, she began coughing, and her cough became worse and worse, and she began to make this deep, retching noise. But this time, when she took her hand away from her mouth, she found it was covered in blood. After that, there was nothing more for a week. But then she began coughing up blood very regularly. Sometimes it was just a small amount, enough to make her mouth red. At other times she would cough up enough to fill a small teacup or even a bowl. I guessed immediately that it was TB and got special permission from our Guruji to let her see a doctor. Western medicine is forbidden to us as so much of it is made using tested on dead animals or torturing animals during the testing process. But given the seriousness of the situation, our Guruji agreed to let a Western doctor look at her, although he insisted that only herbal medicine could be given to her, and only at the time of her daily meal. Puryogamati remained very calm, and for a long time she hoped she might recover her health. Even when it became clear that this was something very serious, she remained composed and peaceful. 
I think it was always me that was more worried. She kept assuring me that she was already feeling better, that it was nothing serious, but in reality you didn't have to be a doctor to see that her health was rapidly deteriorating. Her digestive system became affected, the bloody coughing continued, and after a while she started showing blood when she went for her ablutions too. Eventually I got permission to take her to a hospital where she had an MRI scan and a full blood test. They diagnosed her problem as Cox's syndrome, advanced TB of the digestive system. They said her haemoglobin was low and her chances were not good. One doctor said if we'd come earlier, they could have helped. We had left it too late. That same day, Prayogamati decided to embrace Salakana. She said she would prefer to give up her body rather than have it taken from her. She said she wanted to die voluntarily, facing it squarely and embracing it, rather than have death ambush her and take her away by force. She was determined to be the victor, not the victim. I tried to argue with her, but like me, once she took a decision, it was almost impossible to get her to change her mind. Despite her pain and her illness, she set out that day to walk a hundred kilometres to see our guru, who was then in Indore, staying at the Shantinat Jain temple. We got there after a terrible week, in which Pirogamati suffered very badly. It was winter, late December, and bitterly cold. But she refused to give up, and when she got to Indore, she asked her Guruji's permission to begin the process of embracing Salekana. He asked Pirogamati if she was sure, and she said yes. When he learned that she would probably not have very long to live, he gave his assent. <laughs> Throughout 2004, Prayagamati gradually began reducing her food. One by one, she gave up all the vegetables she used to eat. She began eating nothing at all on several days of the week. For 18 months, she ate less and less. Normally, Salakana is very peaceful, but for Prayagamati, because of her illness, her end was full of pain. My job was to feed her, to look after her and read the prescribed texts and mantras. I was also there to talk to her and give her courage and companionship. I stayed with her 24 hours a day and took the leadership of her samadhi. Throughout, she tolerated everything, all the pain and discomfort, and stayed completely calm. Such calmness you can hardly imagine. I always enjoyed her company and I always learnt from her, but never more than towards the end. She showed how it is possible to keep quiet and smilingly show acceptance, no matter how much you are suffering. Such a person will not be born again. By September 2005, she had become bedridden and was, I would remain continually by her side for three months until the beginning of December. By this stage, she was eating only five things, pomegranate juice, milk, dal and sugar. Every day, she would eat a little less. In the last week, she was given protein injections by a Jane doctor, but was very weak. She had to summon all her strength to perform the observations that have to be followed during Salekana. During these last days, our Guruji was not there. He had gone away for a function. So for the last days, I was the only person she knew in that temple. Though many Munis were there to sing and chant, and support her. The next day the fever was still there and again the doctor came and she asked for some food but she could not stand. In fact she could not open her mouth. He advised her to drink half a glass of milk and this she took. For some reason she wanted to clean her teeth but she didn't have the strength and the doctor advised her to rest. She was very frustrated by this. Just after 1.30 I went to take my food and was just starting eating when Preogamati cried out loudly. I rushed to look after her. It was clear that her condition was not good at all. There was no one around except a boy at the gate. So I sent him off for the doctor. When I came back, I held her hand and she whispered that she wanted to stop all remaining food. Her suffering was too much for her now. She said that for her, death was as welcome as life. And there was a time to live and a time to die. Now she said, 
the time has come for me to be liberated from this body. By that time, our Guruji had returned and he gathered the community. By early afternoon, all the Gurus and Matajis were there guiding her and sitting around her bed. Others came to touch her feet. The room was full of people and so was the veranda outside. Everyone was chanting the Namo Kara Mantra, singing bhajans and kirtans and reading the Jain texts which explained the nature of the soul. Everyone was there to support Bhagavati, to give her courage as she began to slip away. Around 4 p.m., the doctor said he thought he was about, she was about to die, but she held on until nine. It was very peaceful in the end. It was dark by then, and the lamps were lit all around the room. Her breathing had been very difficult that day, but towards the end it became easier. I held her hand, the monks chanted, and her eyes closed. For a while, even I didn't know she had gone. She just slipped away. When I realised she had left, I wept bitterly. We are not supposed to do this, and our Guruji frowned at me, but I couldn't help myself. I had followed all the steps correctly until she passed away, but then everything I had bottled out, up came pouring out. Her body was still there, but she was not in it. It was no longer her. The next day, the 15th of December, she was cremated. They burnt her at 4 p.m. All the devotees in Indore came, over 2,000 people. It was a Sunday. The following morning at dawn, I got up and headed off. There was no reason to stay. It was the first time as a nun that I had ever walked anywhere alone. Thank you.